Hello, one final announcement. This is a very brief one. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of it, I don't think I can share any images with you, but I'm going to keep this really short. So the final two readings this week, Judith Jarvis Thompson's A Defense of Abortion and Scott Kusendorf's The Vanishing Pro-Life Apologist. I think both of these readings have issues, but they have, interestingly enough, um, different issues, opposing issues. Judith Thompson's article is structured around what we call arguments by analogy. Now, this is a common tool in academia, particularly in philosophy, and even more so in law. An analogy usually posits a hypothetical that highlights a conflict, conflict between two principles. For example, classically, Justice Holmes once observed that there is no right to yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, if we just take that literally, then why in the heck is he bothering to say this? How, many, how often does it occur that people cry fire in a public theater? It's an analogy. He was uh, not only talking about the setting of a crowded theater and or only yelling out that particular word. This was effectively an analogy or a metaphor. Any provocative speech, which is likely to have the known effect of prompting people to harm other people is known as incitement. And it is not covered by the principle of free speech. When free speech and preservation of human life coming into conflict, the latter trumps the former. In a similar vein, Judith Thompson structures her arguments for abortion around analogies and hypotheticals. Problem is, ideally, a good analogy should one highlight the dilemma between two values, such as Justice Holmes' statement, while being within a reasonable range of plausibility. Um, thus, for example, we've already covered in another announcement the trolley problem, which posits the somewhat implausible possibility of a random viewer having access to a switch to shift the track of the oncoming runaway trolley. But that is not in itself over the top. It could conceivably occur. Similarly, uh, in another announcement, there was a link to Kant's hypothetical about a knife-wielding person knocking at the door of a house to request access to their intended victim. Now, that's also a bit implausible. How likely is it that a knife-wielding assassin is going to politely knock at a door to petition entry to be able to attack the spouse of the person answering the door. Assassins are not known for their command of etiquette. Uh, that said, even though it's a little bit of implausible, there is a historic precedent. For example, it was not unheard of for Roman emperors to send someone with a sword to a politician who had fallen into disfavor. And when the door was answered, they would tell the politician in question, use this or have it used on you. Well, committing suicide, if you were in a state of dishonor, was considered honorable. It was considered to help redeem your dishonor in ancient Rome, whereas murder was per se dishonorable. So far more often than not, when thus confronted, Roman politicians, especially senators, put the point of the sword against their own chest and fall on. So there is some precedent, but as I said, it's also a little bit implausible. Well, that said, ah, one issue I see with Thompson's essay is that her analogies often strike me as being a bit over the top. But you see, this is more a problem of rhetoric than a problem of philosophy. The absurdity of the hypothetical is not the point. The point is to highlight an ethical dilemma. So if you dismiss her points because of the absurdity of the hypotheticals, 
that's missing the point. And I'm afraid, especially now that I've posted this announcement, I can't give you credit if that is your answer. Speaking about the distinction between rhetoric and philosophy, there's a different range of issues with Kusendorf's essay. As I read it, and I just reread it yesterday, it strikes me as being more about rhetoric than about philosophy. It seems to be mostly devoted to the question how to frame arguments against abortion to have as visible an impact as possible, rather than the nature of ethical conflicts involved in such a decision. Now, to his credit, Cousin Dorf, in the last page or two of his essay, does make some semi-philosophical arguments. Those pages, if you want to cite Klusendorf as a support for a point that you want to make, you probably want to focus on those last two pages. But a lot of his essay, uh, if, um, if Thompson was mostly philosophy, but was some flawed rhetoric, uh, this one is mostly rhetoric with a little bit of philosophy at the end. I'm not sure if they are really good companion pieces to each other. So, comments and observations, please bear that in mind when writing your answers to this week's writing assignment and or discussion board. Ciao.